I'll be your chair for this round. My name is Shudipto. I have no preferred pronouns. Judging with me today are. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Reynaldo. My preferred term pronoun is he or him, and all the best. Hi, everyone. My name is Rush. Too. My preferred pronouns are he or they. Uh, good luck for the round. All right, and now for, over to the teams, uh, starting with side F. Hi, David speaking first, no pronoun pref. Hi, uh, my name is Miko. I'll be speaking second in reply. I have no preference as well. Hi, Toby speaking third, uh, no pronoun preference. Okay, thank you, and now for side neg. You're muted, by the way. Sorry, technical difficulties. I'm the speaking first in reply, she, her. Sha speaking second, he, they. Grace, third, she, her. All right, excellent. Um, now, if I could just get a brief confirmation about the motion you're debating, it is motion C, um, that we oppose self-help narratives, correct? Yep. Yep. All right, excellent. And I'll just check the chat for ones that you vetoed. Uh, okay, so I think both of you vetoed the first motion. Excellent. So just a bit of housekeeping then. Um, I will attempt to time you. I'll drop the six minute and eight minute markers as well as the 8.15 if time permits. Um, but do time yourselves. Remember to wrap up by 8.15. Having said that, may we have the first affirmative speaker to kick off this debate here, here. Hi, can I be heard? Yep, you're visible and audible. Okay. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Human beings strive towards validation as it is an inherent tenet of the human condition. The question that dominates most of our lives is whether or not this should be primarily external or internal. We believe it should be more external and we oppose self-help narratives that say it should be more internal because that is a natural counterfactual to this. What exactly are the norms we are opposing and how do we envision the counterfactual? There are a few key features. First, Obviously, ours is not a world where all sorts of problematic standards like problematic beauty standards are forwarded by self-help. There will be no book that says you should accept everything everyone says to you ever. And it's incredibly unlikely that the self-help industry would forward that. We're not forced to accept all external validation that would be just as ridiculous as expecting negative to defend complete seclusion from the world. Secondly, we think our world is one that allows you to pick and choose the most constructive types of external validation. One where you are encouraged to admit that you need external validation, but where you're free to improve the quality of your sources. Because not rely, because admittedly, we are still reliant on it, but we have the capacity to manage it. And you know, it does, this motion doesn't bar us from improving the quality of these support systems. So choosing healthier support systems, finding friends and communities that have your best interests, reaching out to others, being more open with your insecurities and being free to correct yourself based on the advice of others. Self-help narratives, thirdly, also have an incentive to ensure this works and promote the positive versions of external validation. One, they're likely to encourage you not only to seek external validations, but also dish this out as well. Secondly, a lot of self-help today recommends gratefulness tools that list which friends you know have your back, tell you to compliment the little things you find about other people and be mindful about your company with them. And thirdly, just we think a good example of this brand of self-help are things like Alcoholics Anonymous or like mindfulness, which use external validation to nudge you in the right direction. Fourthly and lastly, to be clear, reducing reliance on external validation means to actively encourage you to shut out the views of others in your process of self-improvement, e.g. prioritizing your own own internal validation at all times. We think a good example of this is the Sigma male archetype that emphasizes being a lone wolf, not caring what women think of you, or more moderately, Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, Fix Your Room brand of self-help. And I just like to note that even if there are some other self-help books, these are just by far the most you know, prominent examples of the self-help narratives that rely on internal validation solely. Having said that then, argument number one, self-help is more constructive to those who need it in AF's world. People turn to self-help because they are going through a period of overwhelming confusion or difficulty in their own lives and are looking for guidance on how to move forward. Importantly, they may know that something feels wrong, but are unable to pinpoint what it is. Why is relying more on internal validation destructive for these people? First, it is incredibly difficult for these people to internally validate themselves, to reassure themselves that they're worthy of their position in life and to feel like they're valuable. There are three structural reasons. First, they don't have the best self-esteem. And we know this because 
by construction, they are already seeking external validation via the self-help book or narrative that they are looking for self-esteem from. Secondly, you alone know all your failures and self-reinforce your lack of certain characteristics because everyone is their own harshest critic because they know of all their failures. So by the first line of logic. The third and last structural reason for this is that psychological biases also encourage you to overfocus on your own dissatisfaction when looking at yourself only. The hedonic treadmill, for example, makes it difficult to credit your own successes. Imposter syndrome makes it difficult for you to feel like you belong in a place because nothing, with, nothing that you did was actually what you did. So what all of this means is that encouraging an increase relatively in internal validation is harmful. One, because in the best case for Neg, nothing changes since they still feel like a failure because nothing changes for them. They're still deeply unhappy. Secondly, in the middle place where they partially disassociate from some validation systems, but not all, they, it's, they are still disproportionately vulnerable to validation and a loss of that validation from say their workplace or their family. But now they have it only as their only source of validation for themselves and have no alternatives, which makes them more likely to plunge into despair and dissatisfaction. And thirdly, in the worst case, where you completely remove yourself from the rest of the external validation systems, not only will we have a second argument as why this is tremendously bad, you also proactively stop these people from seeking out the external help they actually need and isolate them from important support systems. So this ends the first line of logic under this first argument that relying more on internal validation is destructive. What is the comparative? Why is external validation better? Firstly, we observe that it's more accessible. You can choose and manage your support systems because they are tangible real world structures. But on comparative, it is so difficult to change yourself because you are the one trying to do the changing. Secondly, community is a shared goal that people mutually strive towards, like religious support groups that give millions of people solace, or for example, Alcoholics Anonymous that we mentioned earlier. There are lots of examples of people trying to help other people because of the mutual gain that it provides them, because of the fact that people want to be validated by others, and so they seek out these systems. And thirdly, and lastly, is that social standards for external validation, even absent an active community, the passive social standards are structurally likely to be good. One, societies grow increasingly progressive over time as levels of education increase and global communication gives people access to more and more ideas. Two, the more and more people participate in this, given our narrative or the lack of opposition towards these external validation, the more diverse and representative it becomes. And thirdly, is that more importantly, the framing risk point is that the marginal changes in this debate is places where social standards are going increasingly powerful and increasingly good because of the fact that these social these self-help books are just becoming more prevalent. Like in a world that was in the society that was tremendously repressive, you wouldn't be having access to the self-help in the first place. So the first point is that external validation is tremendously more accessible and thus much better for people. Secondly, external validation often is the, is the cause for many of these problems and choosing to fix internal validation doesn't actually fix the problem. E.g. you don't have a support group or a community around you that makes you feel loved. And what's important to realize is that the problem, it's important to realize that that is the problem in order to nudge you in the direction of making steps to improve your life. E.g. finding new hobbies, leaving a potentially toxic relationship that is denying you your validation and so on. This is important because we show that your personal problems are often linked to other people, which even in God's best, uh, next best case where they introspect, they don't feel any more fulfilled. And the third and last reason for why our comparative is better is because the process itself of seeking external validation is good for internal validation. Often there are very clear things to improve on in your life that you need someone else to force onto you or hold you accountable to, e.g. exercising more. But there are many things that you don't notice about yourself, many bad habits you have or good ways or good habits that you can't point out to yourself that you simply can't you can't self-reflect on because you don't have the tools available to you these are all important first of all because we illustrate that people are substantially happier first on the level of scale that is to say the vast majority of people would be deeply dissatisfied with next world which is why many people are still deeply unhappy with like the alpha male narratives with all these self-help books you know despite you know record high rates of depression and dissatisfaction but secondly additionally on a level of gravity people are just far more likely to pull themselves out of the sadness and are far more likely to give themselves a better life Second argument, external validation also matters in preventing the worst behavior. And this presumes the best case of NEG, which is that these people indeed do believe in, in, in this internal validation and shut out more and more the external validation we think is necessary. Why? Many of those struggling with their own battles are not perfect. And in fact, a lot of those who are guilty and have harmed others are those who likely need self-help in order to feel more comfortable with themselves and their consciences. We think this may reinforce potentially harmful behaviors on other people. Why? Because of the fact that one, some of these self-help books allow you to justify some of this behavior that fits of rage or harmful words are just consequences of your tough times and your personal struggles. That too, even if they did tell you to introspect, many people don't know what they did wrong and how they may have hurt others. With self-help narratives that rely on internal validation are forced to generalize because they cannot be specific to your specific instance of harm towards others. And thirdly, that even if you could, you could also put, learn to potentially blame others because you're just misunderstood and you're a victim to society that doesn't accept you. Our counterfactual works better. One, because the need for external validation often leads to the need to find forgiveness and the hope that you can change 
change as a person in order to better yourself for those who you may, whom you may have hurt before. And two, it's a lot easier to know that as well that what others may need since you do not have personal access to that. But the desire for external validation may help you understand how to become a better friend, family member, or more by finding it out from these people. This is very important since it's a lot better since it prevents third party harms. Even presuming Neg has the best possible version of self help, if it causes more harm towards other people, more people around them in those social circles, it's just not worth it. And beyond that, on Neg, it can cause a further amount of problems if it's not fixed because they feel guilty for hurting people again and again and become alienated over time. For this reason, you must affirm. Thank you. I thank the speaker for that speech. May we now have the first negative to make a case for the side bank. Yeah. Starting my speech in three, two, one. We will win this debate by proving that these narratives are unique and are essential because they help people address very common problems that can seem insurmountable when your validation apply, uh, relies on other people telling you that you are worthwhile. We obviously still have support systems on our side, and self-help movements also act in the best way they possibly can. The question is just how this applies to individuals. So on that basis, three quick points of extraneous rebuttal. The first is that we obviously do not have to stand by subreddits that tell incels that women are able to give men internal validation. That is not self-help, it is radicalization. External validation is in fact probably what tells these alpha men they are lacking something because their chins are small or whatever. When they are told not to care about things like beauty standards, they're able to feel better about themselves. And the issue is what Ateneo doesn't explain is why the groups that people go to for external validation on their side of the house are necessarily good support groups. I think it is likely to be like those bad groups that ACT describes, cults that tell you that you are perfect if you follow them because they will give you value. The second thing to say is that our side obviously does not require exclusion of all other people in society. It tells you that wider society, which may tell you is uh, that you are worthless, can be underway. And this means that a lot of their support network stuff is actually applied in quite a weird manner because introspection and internal validation does not mean blaming yourself for everything that goes wrong in your life. It says that you ought not to let other people treat you like crap. If anything, I think this helps you build good relationships with others when you are not being walked all over. The final thing to say is that I think other norms already exist to tell people not to be selfish, but our push is unique because things like drives to charity for being understanding and caring about other people already exist, especially in the context where that is necessary for things like social justice movements, but self-care narratives are a unique push that encourage people to look after themselves, especially considering the fact that these narratives are often based in things like morality and being good because they are rooted in ideas like Buddhism that says you ought not to do harm uh, on others, but also not let them do harm to yours. Why are these narratives, firstly, then good and essential? Because I think the first thing to flag is just obviously that external validation is harmful because it necessarily makes you compare yourself to other people every day. It makes you measure yourself against the value that is assigned to people and to assign to other people. So you see things like the amount of likes that other people get and you get into your head about whether they might have more friends than you because they are skinnier or more beautiful, which leads to things like cycles of immense depression, despondency, anxiety, and even people People buying into eating disorders just to fit into ideas of what external validation means and what it means to like people. Obviously, it is not the case that these narratives are telling you to be depressed and compare yourself to others, but the very necessity that you rely on external validation means that your rat brain chases what it means to feel good about yourself, which necessarily relies on other people liking you. What are the four specific reasons I think that external validation is incredibly harmful? The first is that it applies in an asymmetric way, just as a nature of basic power structures. That means, for example, that women have to validate their worth through relationships and stay in relationships that hurt them or do not speak up against men that mistreat them. It means that minorities can conform themselves to white majority culture, they abandon their own norms because that is what makes the majority like them more. But I also think it applies in a class metric. So you subjugate yourself to your boss's whims in order to impress them so that other people think that you are valuable. The second reason why it is incredibly harmful is that it can be taken away at any moment. And we know this is true. Why is that the case? It's because relationships ebb and flow as a natural point. You might break up with someone, you might move countries, your friends get into fights, or there are tensions at work. When this natural narrative does not exist, you feel terrible anytime these relationships happen because your value is reliant on other people liking you. It is especially important in the context where that external validation is taken away and you feel crap and you have anxiety to have self-help telling you that it is okay to feel good about yourself even if other people are not happy with you at the moment. 
The third thing to say is that it places you in a position where you are always and constantly pleasing other people because you get value based on how others see you. The value they assign to you is what determines uh, determines external validation. I think this applies in two particularly harmful ways. Firstly, just in the rat race of careers and capitalism is that you constantly burn yourself out in order to make sure that your bosses like you, that you are someone that is pleasing your higher uppers. But it also just means things like not standing up for yourself in positions of conflicts so you are seen as an agreeable person that is easy to get along with, which particularly affects minorities, right? The very idea that you do not want to be seen as like an angry black woman might be the reason why you put yourself in a position of subjugation. But the final reason why these uh, norms are incredibly harmful is that it makes you constantly compare yourself to the values that are applied to others. So as already mentioned, value is assigned to people and measured in how happy they seem or the amount of likes they get. But importantly, the cycle becomes cyclical at the point where everyone is chasing external validation because they present themselves as increasingly perfect versions of themselves that makes you measure yourself against the value that those perfect people are getting. The second reason uh, as to why this problem is so uh, so big and hard to solve is that external validation is an epidemic. Like the very fact that social media defines people by the likes that they get, the amount of friends they make, is just particularly harmful because you can't do things like opt out of social media where the network effect means that all work, all debating, all friendships and all those things are taking place on social media. But you also don't see people in the real world so much when things like COVID drive people online. And the very fact that globalization means that you're constantly connecting with people that you will never see face to face necessarily means that people are driven to these websites. And social media companies market the idea of external validation by doing things like creating metrics that demonstrate how many likes creators are getting, but make it addictive by uh, highlighting those comparisons. So the fact that some websites might prioritize you in the first few months that you are present and give you all of that serotonin that you get and dopamine that you get from being particularly liked and they take that away from you and make you commit yourself even more and more is what necessarily reduces reduces your self-esteem. The final reason though, why it is good for the self-help movement to push back against this is that this narrative is a unique way to push against these competing pressures because obviously this is a continually existing problem because companies have an incentive to keep you addicted. But I think importantly, it is very difficult for people to change the actual circumstances they live in, whereas they can quite easily change their perception. Like you cannot change the fact that you are a minority living in a white majority country and that sexism and racism probably impacts you on the day-to-day Day, but you can look inwards and tell yourself that it is unacceptable that people treat you that way, that you ought not to feel bad about yourself just because other people are choosing to oppress you. I think the most important thing to say is that it is basically impossible for your external validation to ever match up to how good your internal validation ought to be when other people base their evaluations on the physical presenting parts of you, which are necessarily based on external characteristics, meaning that any external valuation of you is never going to be based on inward looking parts of you, the inner sanctum of your thoughts. Only you necessarily have the power to highlight those things, which is why it is so important. I think the final thing to say though, is that the self-help movement is a unique force for getting people to buy into these narratives. And I think we can even defend the shallowest version of the self-help movement, right? Which is that these like posts they make are incredibly pretty. The algorithm bumps them and people like to feel good about about themselves so they engage with them but that's how but like positive psychology works right you affirm your internal validation every day you say you have internal value daily and you tell people not to worry about themselves that helps people because it's a literal battering ram telling them they are good and valuable regardless of the rest of the world but even if this is not a long-term um mechanism to help people because it's shallow it is still essential because people access self-help at the moment where they've hit short-term crises like breakups and they feel that their value is low self-help uniquely can tell people in these crisis moments where they have nowhere else to turn to that they do have value and importance and it doesn't matter what other people think about them but the final thing to say is that it obviously is a long-term movement because it's incredibly popular and it sends people down rabbit holes things like buddhism and meditation that do actually help people in the long run so i think that means that external validation being a battery ram for the self-help movement pushes back against, helps people in the most quantifiable way, so proud to oppose. I thank the speaker for that speech. Maybe now I have the second affirmative to extend the affirmative case. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Cool, thanks.
right, I'm going to start my speech in three, two, one. The first thing I want to note is that a lot of their problems with external validation are likely going to be fixed by an increased participation within that external validation. What does this mean? The first thing to point out is that if it is incredibly difficult to be able to access external validation, what we claim is that when people have a mutual incentive to try and get together, to want to be friends with one another, it becomes a lot easier to ensure you don't treat people like garbage as they say, because that is also a personal threat to your own ability to get external validation. Which is why it's likely friends are likely to be nice to one another. It's likely that there's so many different avenues that people can access today for external validation, like religion, the emphasis placed on family, the ability to create communities around different kinds of interests like debating or many other different things, because there's a mutual interest in trying to ensure you can get that external validation from one another, which gives both the access and the incentive for people to want to be nicer and kinder towards one another. So I think this responds to their claim that you don't want to be walked over. You don't want to be treated like garbage. In fact, I'd argue that when people are so sure of themselves, when people don't need to be liked by other people, that's when they're more likely to engage in those kinds of behaviors. I.e., when you think that this person is less than you, that they're not as good as you, that you are superior to them. And precisely, this impacts the people who are most likely to need self-help the most because they're the least likely to do this, but the most likely to suffer from this kind of behavior, that you're more likely to walk on other people. I don't think they like build a counterfactual for this. But the second thing I want to note is that insofar as more people would like to engage in this kind of behavior, it also ensures that their narratives become more inclusive, more diverse, and more representative. So when it comes to minority groups, it becomes easier and easier to become accepting of different forms of behavior, to become like, accepting of different kinds of cultures, beliefs, and personalities, insofar as more and more people are trying to engage in it and therefore are willing to speak their voice with that regard. In fact, I'd argue is they don't, firstly, build why internal validation for these minority groups is going to be any better. In fact, what I'd argue is that these structures of power with, that try and marginalize these same groups are the ones that try and ensure that they internalize to them that it was their fault to do certain things. They are a certain way and therefore should not be celebrated or accepted within society. And I'd make the argument that the ability for them to find one another, to talk about their issues, and the ability for them to create communities around one another are therefore the ones that are most likely to ensure that they will go over or rather be able to go against these kinds of harmful internalized beliefs versus ones where they are divided and therefore it is far easier for white uh, mainstream white media, for like ideological state institutions to be able to ensure that people are more willing to internalize these bad thoughts about themselves. Secondly, they say that you still would like support systems on either side of the house. I have multiple responses here. The first thing I'd want to note is their harms of you comparing yourself to the people you see on Facebook actually gets a lot worse. And that's because when you are less likely to be involved, but still have a degree of social interaction, it's most likely that the only posts you'll see, the only people you'll see are the ones with the most likes, are the ones who, without having to personally interact with them, would have made it to your newsfeed. And therefore it becomes harder and harder because the people you're most likely to see are the ones at the very top who will reach everyone's news feeds, who will be able to put themselves in the media, etc. And therefore the point of comparison is far more difficult. What I'd argue here is that when you try and get more external validation, it's obviously not just likes. It ensures that there is a more active process and engagement interaction with other people, being in more Facebook groups, engaging in more group chats, wanting to talk to other people, become friends and compliment each other about maybe their debating skills or whatever have you, it makes it a lot easier to talk with people that are more likely to be living the same kind of lifestyle as you, see people on an everyday basis, and moreover, the ability to interact on a deeper level also makes it likely that you see a lot more about them, not just their wins and their victories, but a lot of their everyday stories since they're more likely to share them with you. Secondly, when you rely on just a few support groups, because obviously they have to reduce that dependence, that ensures that these support groups are less likely to work for you. I'd argue having a larger number of people to try and ensure you can get validation from is better. One, because all the reasons they say of these support groups could leave you, something could go wrong. It ensures that you have other places to go through. So if you go through a bad breakup, if your family's not doing so well, having different groups of friends, having a supportive like spouse, etc., are likely to work out for you when other things don't work out. But secondly, is that when you have that kind of dependence on a small number of groups, it becomes harder to access that kind of validation to begin with. So it doesn't matter, like they could like you a lot, but they could just be busy. And therefore you feel like you're left out, even if it's not a fault of your own. 
but being able to engage in many different kinds of groups, engaging with more different kinds of people are more likely to ensure you don't like circumstance, logistics doesn't prevent you from accessing a meaningful friendship or be bored or feel lonely for an entire day, week or month. Just because these are like a small number of people that have their own lives and different things to want to attend to. But thirdly, is that you can have different sources of validation, i.e. when you want external validation, you're more likely to engage with different kinds of communities. And therefore, it's a lot easier to get validation in many different ways. If you don't have a good weekend as a speaker, maybe you can go back to your family and ensure that you have a good dinner and like talk and like lovingly to one another. If you don't have a good weekend as like whatever hobbies that you might have, you could have other hobbies. Maybe you have a good weekday at work. All these different things ensure that there are constant and different varying sources of validation rather than either a small number of support groups or just yourself. And I'd actually argue that this is far worse. They don't really explain why it's very accessible to get internal validation. The first thing I'd like to note is that if you are likely accessing a self-help book, this is something you're already personally struggling with. When the comparative is, a lot of people can point out things, as David says, that you don't really know about yourself that you might want to begin to notice. So if it's bad things, I want to emphasize there's little response to our argument on morally incorrect behavior. I'll get more on that later. But even a lot of good things. Sometimes you don't know what you did well as a speaker or what you did well as a judge until someone gives you glowing feedback. Sometimes you don't notice that you had a nice, like, like you know, you wore something nice that day or you had a nice haircut until someone compliments you on it. These are small things that when you are relying on yourself, who already largely probably has a negative perception to some extent, it becomes harder and harder to access self-validation. Uh, next is on curation. You will adjust the social standards. Again, I'd like to note that this is not mutually exclusive insofar as they still, one, don't cut themselves off from the rest of society. But two, as I've mentioned, it is likely the only people you're able to access are the ones that are already the most famous, already at the top. But secondly, some degree of curation is great. I am happy that if I mess up a speech, I can go like, as a math major to my classroom the next day and know that nobody's going to remember that. I am happy that I can access different kinds of things that I want to do for myself when you have different communities that can build around you versus yourself. They say you know yourself best. Yes, all your traumas, all your mistakes, all of that comes back to you at night when you're thinking alone in your bed. And it gets very difficult to overcome for all the reasons I've already explained. Curation to an extent is liberating. It allows you to explore many different identities. And also it allows you to start anew when you feel like you have messed up so much in the past. Lastly, moral conformity is not just the Buddhist belief that you should fix yourself because there are two things that fails to do. The first is that sometimes you don't know you've harmed other people and needing external validation and the, like, you know, and forgiveness and wanting to become friends again is often important in recognizing that there is fault and that you will not repeat that. But secondly, is that sometimes you don't know how to fix this problem, i.e. maybe your spouse like, you know, flirted with someone else, but you think that the only way to fix it is to become more restrictive, more protecting, stop them from being able to talk with other people when you that's only going to fray relations. A lot of the time, external validation is likely to inform you not only if you've done something wrong, but the nature by which you can reparate for these and make you a better person as a consequence. It's not enough to think, have I done anything wrong? Because sometimes you are unable to identify that and that harms the most vulnerable, that harms a lot of innocent people, that harms a lot of third parties. I'm very proud to propose. I thank the speaker for that speech. Maybe now I have the second negative to extend the name case further. Am I audible? Yep, audible and visible. Awesome. I'm going to start off by explaining what I think is the counterfactuals provi provided by side affirming, because it's pretty counterintuitive, right? And I think they dress it up in a lot of fancy words, but I don't think at all that your ability to find a, a significant group of people that's going to provide you an important form of external validation that is unique and good is something that they get to fear on their side of the house. I want to explain this in two points. Firstly, how you are how how are you able in the counterfactual to find a group of individuals that are likely to validate you at all? So the first thing to note is that in to the extent that the dominant norm and the way you get self-help isn't looking in, inwards internally towards your own self-validation, there'll be competing narratives of validation, right? And that is not to say that you are able to find one 
like uniform uh, system of validation just from your close friends, for example, but it often forms the same way that Miko is talking about. And then I think Umber also uh, uh, addresses in that in, in her speech, which is that it forms around things like religion. It forms around things of like political ideology, right? like neo-Nazis on the internet, which is often bad for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because you're competing with other groups in that validation and because you essentially then choose one validation over another one, because you obviously care more about a certain group of people validating you than another group of group validating you. The status quo, as we've already established, you probably care more about the majority's validation of that. And that is, that's why it's bad when it plays on power structures, like how women want the validation of men, how minorities want the validation of majorities, because that's the way it's advertised and reinforced over and over in social groups. But in their world, now the most vulnerable individuals who are searching ex for external validation are going to be competed for by different groups. And the way that different groups compete, the same way that religion competes, the same way that I think debating also competes, is they make fun of other groups, or not just make fun of other groups, but ensure that you are not able to do the thing that Miko wants to assert you do, which is to go and find and meet different kinds of people and have different hobbies, right? And that's why debaters make fun of people who uh, model United Nations. That, that's why religious groups make fun of other religious groups and making fun is just a nice way of saying things right it's, it's actually that they say you shouldn't go to those individuals you should be only relying on our validation and that is harmful because the most vulnerable people then don't have the autonomy and agency to pick and choose between different groups or to go to different groups as miko wants to talk to you about right and that's particularly important because as we've explained when you are focused on external validation that makes you completely vulnerable to that external validation you're reliant onto it and which means that to the extent that that group fails you the group leaves you or you're kicked out of that group like for example when you're excommunicated from religions for certain things that is far more harmful and that can be cyclical which means you can't guarantee that the group you find to get external validation on their side is ever going to be beneficial to you in the long term which means that you are likely to face those harms unless you're able to find solace and a baseline of internal validation and that's why it's not comparative on their side to say well you can just find a better group of external validation but the second thing to note here is because of the massive amount of power that external validation has over you especially within groups you're likely to be in indoctrinated into that group as well, which means it comes with costs, right? And often these are hidden costs that come down the road. Look at religion, look at the way that people get sucked into neo-Nazi websites and, and communities that give them external validation when they're feeling confused. And then, you, you know, that means you are likely inculcated with relatively harmful viewpoints sometimes, or you're, those groups are likely to be corrupted by people at the top, the people who have control over that narrative, because they acknowledge that that external validation is something you crave and they're able to use that to manipulate you. So there is no analysis at all or mechanisms from that side house to suggest that the alternative is always going to be a good form of validation that you're likely to be to, to get. And it's not necessarily going to be more accepting either, because as they're competing to get individuals into your web of external validation, that is particularly harmful. Look at all the material we brought you in terms of cacaos. But in general, you don't have the time to go to different groups. You don't have the time to actually do that. But as I've already said, often to be in one group, you often have to, uh, uh, it's often made in opposition to other groups. Why is it different on our side of the house? Because if you have a baseline intern, internal validation, however strong that may be, right? Even if it's even particularly weak, you still have a baseline to fall onto where you're able to some, to some extent say, I do not necessarily need your external validation. I don't care about what you particularly say about me. I care what I want to do. That gives individuals the agency and autonomy to be able to fulfill their own agenda, their own hobby. So that lets me go to different groups. So I don't care what my basketball friends say when I go play cricket. I don't care what my cricket friends say when I go play basketball. I get that kind of ability to go either way. Obviously, these examples are low level, but think of the worst instances are pretty harmful if you are sucked into one group and don't have the ability to leave. Mm -hmm. Even in the best case of their side, you often need a base to confront bad standards. So let's say the only narratives on their side, the only groups are the good groups that are external validation. The status quo, as you've already established, and I think they accept, are when you have like you know the bad standards of body images or, 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 or of minorities being uh, subsumed by majority culture. Those kinds of things exist in the status quo. Even if you assume on their side that there is good groups like the uh, you know AA, for example, that are trying to get you in there, how are you able to? choose those standards, right? They haven't provided us a mechanism as to how their self-help actually gives you the power to reject the 
overwhelmingly majoritarian norms and standards that apply day to day on you in a way that it makes you pick uh, someone else. So the problem is that if you're looking for validation outside from where you've lost your validation at a particular point, either on the asset that will leave their community, which makes you further alone. For example, if you are in, in like your family doesn't accept the fact that you want to do something and you crave the external validation, side affirming says you should go look for other groups that will give you the validation that you seek. But that's harmful because that means you're leaving your community and you're now beholden to new sets of communities that don't necessarily know you that well, that you don't know that well, but you crave the external validation, see cult material as well, right? But also that means you're most likely going to go to the proximal groups, again, harm, harmful instances of going to religious cults and you're Nazis specifically when you're in the worst, when you're, you're most vulnerable. But maybe that's not the worst case. It's like really hard to fight against the social media norms and beauty standards and majoritarian norms because you can't disengage from that without the ability to say, I don't need external validation at all instead of picking and choosing between a very powerful one and a weaker one, it's much easier to center that on yourself. Why is that good on our side of the house, right? Because even to the extent that you don't necessarily have to overcome all external validation, it's an important counter narrative to the new form of like social media control that is pushing you to externally validate yourself, right? Because it's much easier not to go and talk to random people on the internet and find out about people like Mika also suggests, but the fact that the social media provides you easy metrics for you to actually engage your external validation. And that is exacerbated by the fact that everyone else also does that. Everyone else is like, oh, look how many likes I got, right? So it's very hard for you to think, okay, I don't really care about those likes. I care about what my friends on Reddit say about me because everyone else has different metrics about that and you're likely to buy into the majoritarian one. The only way that you can compete against that, the uniqueness material that came from Umba Unresponded is to say, I don't really necessarily need to care about external validation at all to some extent. I'm able to do it myself. And now I'm going to explain to you why it's important that, that they don't understand how this internal validation actually works, right? how self-help works there. It doesn't necessarily mean that you hide your bad uh, effects. It often makes you confront yourself in an ability to figure out what you don't like about yourself, other people don't like about yourself, either changing that yourself and being in peace with that, or to the extent that you can't change it, like by the fact that you're a minority, the fact that you maybe can't exercise and get like lose weight because that's how you're biologically made means that the kinds of affirmations that they want to talk about is that maybe you should exercise is actually really harmful to some people who can't opt out of that. But that's just status quo on their side, right? When you're able to get that validation that is particularly harmful, right? If you're in a bad, if you're doing bad things and you are not able to confront that on your Yourself in the way that you know most mindfulness works, most Buddhist apps, for example, that are a very big industry that compete against each other on app stores, which means the best ones get out. You are unlikely then to make any sort of significant change in yourself if you're in a bad group and they have given us no analysis at all to suggest that you're likely to pick the good group all the time. Whereas on our side, we minim minimize the harm as much as we can to the majority of people, side with side negative. I thank the speaker for that speech. Maybe now have the third affirmative. Uh, hi, I'm gonna assume everything's okay. Uh, just tell me if anything's, oh, sorry. I think there's a bit of background noise, but just tell me if anything's inaudible. Um, no, you are good. Just a bit of a uh, background noise, but I, I think that's gone now, it's fine. Yeah, sorry, it's uh, people in the building. I can't really do anything about it, but anyways, I'll try to be loud. <laughs> so I'll start in three, Two, one. In their darkest hour, we say self-help must encourage you to look outwards to the friends and family to remind you that you are loved and validated rather than plunge you back into the depths of your own self-loathing. Because till this point, what this negative team has failed to describe for you is what the process of confronting your inner demons look like. I'm not sure what the inner sanctum of the mind they talk about is, but I am sure that for many people and the ones who need validation the most, it's likely to be dark and scary. I want to talk about three things in this speech. First, how the process of validation happens on either side, very clearly outlining what they did. Next, I want to talk about which type of validation is more valuable to the average person that needs self-help. And importantly, finally, I want to talk about what self-help cultures form on either side, how people outside the person seeking help, self-help react to this norm. Let's begin with what the process of validation looks like. And I want to clarify the margins as to what internal validation really is on NEG. And in particularly, there are two things I want to call out. Firstly, NEG doesn't do the legwork to show how any of their uncharitable illustrations 
citizens of our world change on their side. If it is true that people live in a constant rat race, that the structure forces them to compare themselves to others, that they're constantly exposed to the lives of others, then it is likely that their own norms of internal validation already formed around those things. You can't just will yourself to stop caring about your social media clout or to stop caring about your body image. That simply isn't something that's going to happen because you just read one book or you started practicing mindfulness, whatever that is. You will still feel bad. You will still base yourself on those metrics, but now you don't think you need to approach other people and consult them as to what those metrics should be. And I think that's why this negative team argues in vagueness. That's why they talk about the inner sanctum of the thoughts without recognizing that your own self-image is an awful thing that you often force onto yourself when there is no one there to correct it. Instead, we suggest the role of self-help, given that external validation is always going to be a constant, is to make you aware of the form of external validation you are currently reliant on and the ways you can seek external validation. I'll clarify that a bit more later. The second thing I want to call out is that Neg can't stand of a mix of, well, we can direct you to external validation. Sometimes we can say you should still sometimes consult your friends for validation rather than just having yourself. And the reason for that is because the way you convince them to rely on internal validation is to attack that very external validation, to attack their source of self-worth from their friends, to argue that they don't need them. Further, there's a predisposition to not seek out others' opinions. If it's, it's incredibly difficult to find self-improve and admit that you need to do hard choices in life, which is why we think the forms of self-help that dominate in their side are the types of toxic self-help we talk about, are the things that tell you you should be a lone wolf, you should isolate yourself and consider only your own egotistic choices. So the process of valuation on their side is based on the internalized standards you already hold when you encounter self-help. What's the comparative? Self-help obviously can't just point you in our world to all the toxic standards in the world and tell you to better fit them. The process has to be more nuanced in order for self-help to gain popularity. People gravitate to what's effective, as we say on either side. What happens in our world is the process of saying, I admit that I need external validation. I currently lack validation. I don't feel externally validated. You ask yourself the question of why do I lack that external validation and where can I find other sources of external validation? So there's a constancy to this process where you are questioning what you are currently reliant on and looking for other ways to find that source of validation as we described from the very top. This brings me nicely to the second issue. What sort of validation is more likely to be effective? And I want to be charitable and assume the best form of internal validation prevails on their side. There is this sort of mindfulness that allows you to detach from the world, even if you're forced to confront it every day. There are two problems still that prevent you from believing the negative case. The first problem is access. From the very beginning, we explained that it's extremely difficult to love yourself. There's a host of psychological biases that push you towards self-loathing. There are many things that you don't know about yourself that are crucial. Things of, like your bad habits, you don't know exactly what is positive. You gravitate towards focusing on negativities and pre-assumed standards that you internalized from the beginning before you even encountered this type of self-help to begin with. And I want to note, the fact that they haven't proved that you can access internal validation is crucial, because if people aren't able to succeed at internally validating themselves, you get all the harms of pushing other people away by rejecting their opinions when you say, I need to focus on myself, but none of the benefits of actually leading to these people getting improvements in their lives. Even importantly, if we have to accept the worst forms of external validation, at least people are happier. Even if they chase a negative body image for instance, or they work harder at work, they feel some improvement because they're able to access that. Rather in your world where nothing changes, they still base their judgment on those same standards, but they feel like a failure. The second question then is on effectivity. And the big push we hear from them is that the groups you cling to are either temporary, they will go away, or they might be bad forms of external validation, like you will join a cult and become a neo-Nazi. Uh, first, this is just incredibly uncomparative and uncharitable. If you're so deeply entrenched in a social group, it's likely that your internal beliefs are all already shaped by theirs anyways. If I grow up in a strict conservative conservative household that, believe, that has shamed me for being gay my whole life, it's unlikely that I'm going to be able to accept myself just because I will it to be so. I obviously need to find a group of others who will externally validate that lifestyle preference for me and tell me that it's okay. But secondly, what breaks this deadlock is your willingness to reach out to new groups. So if you believe there are problematic forms of validation that can exist on either side, what matters most is the individual uh, exposure to new groups and their willingness to be convinced that new groups are good. Importantly, that never happens on their side because you always resort, you always turn back to the individual as the ultimate arbiter of this, whereas in our world, you tell them that there are other groups that are more knowledgeable about this stuff, that are more able to provide you with this type of reassurance, and we think those groups, as we prove from David, are overwhelmingly 
likely to be positive. Like realistically, Alcoholics Anonymous isn't going to stop you from seeing your family. This isn't the type of uh, like a mutual interaction they're going to prevent you from. It's more likely that they push you to those groups and encourage you to find ways to diversify your sources of validation, which means we also overcome their problem of temporariness. So not only is this the only accessible portion of a validation that's been proven in the round, it's also the most effective. Finally then, what type of self-help culture forms on either side? Because there are, there's an important aspect of her case they've neglected, because what matters isn't just how the individual seeking self-help believes they can get that, but also what the people around them believe and what they do to participate in the process of helping this individual through a crisis. We give you two important claims here that don't get a response. The first thing we say is that there's now a norm of providing external validation. When people see self-help as a community thing, as they believe that they should proactively help and reach out, they do what we tell you, which is your family and friends are less likely to reject you. They're more likely to be willing to have that type of open conversation with you because they themselves know this is the best way to help you through something rather than a world where you initially shut them out because you say, I don't want to listen to your opinions. I don't think they matter to me. And there's a more uh, positive sort of dialogue that accrues in our world. The second thing that's important is you're more likely to form support groups in the first place when everyone is looking for better forms of external validation. This also responds to their claim that you're the groups you will form around are bad. If there is currently a scarcity of groups available to you in your area, like you don't have many friends, when the norm is that everyone seeks external validation from others and is looking for positive forms of external validation, it's more likely that they're going to be willing to opening up to open up to you and having that sort of discussion over time, which means you get more choices also beating their claim. What was the comparative they neglected? We say it's two possibilities. The first is a world where people are more willing to tolerate toxicity, a world where people think, oh, I'm doing this for myself. It's OK that I'm an asshole. It's OK that I'm a jerk or simply not knowing what behaviors cause them to be a jerk. But even the middle ground is a world of apathy, a world where people view self-help as an individual struggle that you have to let people go through, where people are unlikely to reach out and unlikely to help. For all those reasons, firm. I thank the speaker for that speech. May we now have the third negative to wrap up the constructive section of this debate. The other team in this debate has tried to prove that external validation is such a toxic system that it ruins your internal validation. And then instead of trying to rebuild your intrinsic self-worth, they think that the best way to do this is to try make sure that all these new hippie communes pop up to overthrow the dominance of, you know, a coercive capitalist companies that exist to profit off your despair and gloom. Obviously, that is a far more ridiculous way to solve the problem of bad ex external systems for validation. Maybe their example, at best case, works if you're thinking about queer teens and conservative communities. Firstly, I still think all the harms of having to, you know, opt out from your family, having to try and understand uh, your family as not your community and move to a different part of the part of the country is probably bad for those people. But secondly, I just think the vast majority of people in this debate aren't necessarily queer teens who've reached a crisis point. I think it is the millions of girls that suffer from disordered eating because they literally cannot opt out of having an Instagram account because everybody has it in order to communicate and, and, and you know, live a real life. I think that's the real harm in this debate. I'm going to do two, I'm going to look at two big points in my speech. Firstly, about external validation. Secondly, about better communities. Sorry, sorry. Firstly, about internal validation. Secondly, about communities. But before I get on to that, I am going to cut out some of the material they told us about why this leads you to regulate your behavior, right? So they wanted to say that, you know, you need people to teach you, uh, you know, when you're doing wrong. Firstly, I just don't think this is necessarily the only way to get that right. Obviously, society has strong ethics around charity, around doing good for other reasons like religion, not necessarily self-help. And I think those still exist. So this isn't the only thing that's going to tell you to self-reflect on your actions. But secondly, if you were talking about the audacity of white men, I do not think in the affirmative team's world, they suddenly begin to care about external validation from women of color and about whether their actions treat those people nicely, right? So very weird benefit for them to try to say. Sweet. First point then about the benefits of intrinsic motivation or validation. 
First thing I want to flag here is that I think both teams agree that some kinds of external validation are particularly bad. But what we told you was that these are the vast majority of extrinsic voices that you hear when you live in a capitalist society where companies literally profit off your self despair so they can sell you something to fix yourself, right? And we never hear a response to this from the other team. And I think the failure to engage with this means that, you know, the vast majority of the examples in this debate are of ones where we provide a unique solution, right? But actually, I think we've gone a step further and proved that all forms of external validation are inherently bad and unstable. And that was for several reasons. Firstly, it was because they were always set on hierarchical lines. Secondly, it was because the bar for meeting external validation would always be raised because people put their best selves forward, they don't tell you the real you, so you are living up to an artificial level of, you know, uh, satisfaction. But three, people are fickle, and no matter how sincere they are, you might just have a fight and it feels really shit if they are your only reason to care about yourself. But fourthly, external validation would always be about your external exterior life, right, which is quite hard to change, versus you can quite easily change your perception and comparison and provide more meaning. We think that this means all of the, the stuff they talked about, about finding better external sources of validation aren't really going to be better because all of the stuff about fickleness, about fragility still applies to those groups and it's still not the best outcome in this debate. What did they attack? They said that internal validation was bad for some people who may have low self-esteem and you know overestimate their failures due to psychological biases. Several responses here. Firstly, I don't think this is true for everybody. The affirmative team tries to say that this debate is only about people who've reached crisis point. But I think that ignores the fact that self-help is a hugely popular hashtag on Instagram, that there are people that build communities around self-help TikToks, there are, that this is literally a huge market of books, right? Like people are not necessarily just about to kill themselves before they look at self-help books. I think it's quite a good industry because people want to self-improve. And so therefore, I actually think we provide a unique benefit to lots of people that the other team does not help at all. But secondly, in terms of the people that are having particular issues with their self-esteem, obviously we don't just say, hey, reflect on yourself and leave them alone with their thoughts. These self-help resources and books are accompanied by people that try to correct the, the wrong biases that society has instilled in you, right? So obviously we actually say, hey, look, you should look into your inner self-worth. And that might mean, you know, uh, you know, stop comparing yourself to others. Don't use this as the metric for your success. Every single human being has intrinsic worth that doesn't require you to do anything or prove anything. And that sort of positive reinforcement can change even the strongest psychological biases. But crucially, that this, if this is the harm that people are facing, the, the affirmative team never tries to do anything. Like this is the only counter voice to try and tell people that they have internal self-worth. Even if it doesn't make a huge difference, I still think we should try and convince people that they have value as human beings. So yeah, um, then we heard that it's, you know, hard to self-improve from third affirmative, you know, that internal validation often doesn't require, often doesn't mean you get honest reflection. But actually, I just don't think the vast majority of people need to improve, right? Like, in the first point I dealt with, I talked about how these people probably aren't doing immoral acts. You probably just feel bad about where you are in life. So it doesn't matter if you honestly self-reflect. What matters is that you feel like you're in a healthier state of mind and you can better tackle the world, right? And also just a quick note in response to second affirmative who says people don't know their own strengths. Firstly, I don't think it's about knowing your strengths. I just think it's about knowing that you as a human being have value without having to compare yourself. But secondly, people do have their own systems for evaluation and it's society that's like, no, that's not trendy. You don't look like the norm. Obviously, I think in the absence of those, you, you trust yourself and you back yourself. You think you look good. You, you know, fuck the conventional speaker score tab. Do whatever you think feels right in your speech. Okay, final point then about better communities. The first thing I want to flag is that obviously communities still exist on our side of the house, right? Um, look, just as a woman, I think it is incredibly empowering to listen to other self-help uh, gurus or women who care about self-help be like, hey, we shouldn't dress for the male gaze. We should dress how we want. And you should not base your self-growth on your appearance. You should base it on your value as a human being, right? That isn't, doesn't mean I have to abscond from society. That self-help community that is about my internal perceptions, my internal worth, still has lots of people like supporting each other and still has people just affirming that belief, right? So it's not necessarily lonely. And I actually think 
that the harm of the affirmative team's case is they insist that you will find better external validation, but that actually comes with the huge cost of having to opt out of your current form of validation, because crucially, you can't just have all these sources of validation and listen to them equally. I think people will always tend to put like, uh, you know, social media first, they'll always tend to put first their family or their co-workers or their boss or the people that matter most to them. So if those voices are the problem, you, you will always listen to them more than other voices. So the only solution is to get rid of those voices and opt out. And I think that can be incredibly, incredibly isolating. But another, a few more reasons why external validation is not the best solution. Firstly, I just don't think these communities will always exist. The other team tries to say that, you know, if people become nicer, then we'll have more communities with nice external validation. But they actually don't walk through this at all. And I think it's highly unlikely that people who are reading a book about helping themselves and trying to, you know, find better worth as a human being genuinely then do the logical thinking to like flip that around and think about society as a whole. I think self-help is a very inwards focused topic that doesn't encourage that kind of philosophical reflection. But secondly, that would require mass buy-in. And the affirmative team doesn't think everyone is reading self-help books. They think only people at crisis are reading self-help books. I don't think that's true. Finally, Shah talks about cults, which are legit. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you for that speech. That also ends the uh, constructive section of the debate. Now for the reply speeches where the time is halved to four minutes, um, may we have the negative reply speech. Uh, yep, you're audible and slow. I think the issue for this affirming team is that in all three substantive speeches, they miss that this motion is about reliance on external validation. Because if you believe them, you can just dabble with external validation to increase your positive thoughts about yourself, but that it could never apply the other way when your reliance on this validation doesn't pan out. Unfortunately, reliance means that the scaffolding of your self-worth is built on the sporadic compliments that communities you seek give you. Your ability to smile is fundamentally tied to a judge, for example, giving you good speaks. And if the only interactions that all humans have are good, then perhaps this is fine. The issue is that I don't always get 79s and 80s in debates, but I shouldn't get depressed when I get a 77 either. The issue for the affirming team is that when my self-worth is built on external validation, getting a 77 and then Aucklanders who did not watch the debate telling me that my speech was fine is not a perfect substitution. I still feel sad when that happens. But what does make a difference is telling people that their worth is not tied to other people's perceptions of them. That is why equity briefings don't say you're a legend and judges are wrong. They tell you that you ought not to base your self-worth and your well-being on other people. Because even if I give a bad speech, being told I did great is not going to make my life better. Knowing that I have value regardless is what lets me move on. Very long debating example, but I think it clarifies the difference between how value is assigned to people. The first question I'm going to ask is if it is believable that an individual that loses external validation that they were reliant on, their first reaction would be like, oh, I'll just find another group that gives me validation, instead of doubling down to try and regain that validation, which causes all the harms we outlined down the line. I think the affirming team cherry picks examples here, but the easiest example is to consider what happens when you see, for example, photos of skinnier women on Instagram. Grace or Shar telling me that, oh, I'm actually skinny, so it's fine, isn't going to fix reality. What's more likely is what happens to millions of young women worldwide, which is developing disordered eating in order to fit into what is valued, for women to minimize themselves in relationships to keep their boyfriends, or for minorities to assimilate to get valued. Because even if you can get validation, somewhere else. The very fact that you start associating your self-worth with the compliments you get means that you constantly chase these compliments. That sends you down this horrible path that the, uh, the affirming team is never able to protect you from because they never explain why the substitution will be perfect. Next, you have to believe that even if they make this choice, they will find a perfect group. Note, though, that if you do not have a base of internal validation, how could you possibly know what kind of group is positive and actually recognizing your value? I think what is more likely is that these groups poke holes at your identity, like the affirming team themselves say. They tell fat people that they could just work out in order to improve themselves because clearly there is something that is wrong with them that makes them feel bad and they could simply fix it. 
The issue is, however, that only individuals know who they are. So it is unclear that these groups know what is good for you and are able to demonstrate that in a good way. Rather, on their side, I think you probably do get isolated into these groups that constantly tell you that this group is perfect because you all validate each other and you ought not to look to other groups for any validation or goodness. I think comparatively on our side of the house, people are secure in themselves. And they can still access their social networks without opting out of other groups entirely because when you have a baseline, those interactions do not negatively affect you. I think what this means is that we win on their grounds, but we take this debate a step further and explain why even in a perfect world, external validation is never guaranteed, while internal validation necessarily is always with you. The only response the affirming team gives is to say that sometimes people will behave selfishly and be cruel because internal validation somehow tells people they are more important than others. The issue is that what we support is the status quo, which means that self-help doesn't tell you to be cruel. It tells you not to accept cruelty. Importantly, people who get caught into self-help follow rabbit holes of introspection through the books they read, as Shar and Grace already demonstrate. All of this means that people do not lose their humanity on our side, but importantly, they know that their humanity has worth and they fight to protect it. I think the speaker for that speech and not end this debate as a whole, maybe half the affirmative reply speaker. Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. You're just a bit distant at the moment, but I think that'll be solved when you're speaking. Hold on, I'll try and move my mic closer as well, just to make sure. Oh, this is this is perfect. All right, hold on. I'm gonna start my speech in three, two, one. How do people begin to heal? Because I think there's a very sparse defense of why internal validation works until perhaps third neg, who to be fair, attempts to do this. But I think number one is they significantly limit the debate to A, the people who are least likely to need this, but B, a glib assertion about everyone in the world doesn't have to be in a crisis point. When David clearly outlines the rising cases of mental health problems and depression that are occurring within many young people in society, and therefore doesn't make this an insignificant amount, more so one that should not be concerned about. But there are three more things I wanna outline about their case. The first is that NEG does not change capitalism and all these different structures, simply self-help. So if these are the same structures that push you towards psychological biases, what that explains is that the harm of this still occurs in their side of the, deba the debate, but the avenues by which you can access healthier forms of external validation, the advice by which you can provide as to how you're able to do that and how you're able to fairly assess that is going to be far less. That does not solve the problem that they do not explain they solve either when they strategically, quote unquote, limit the ability of self-help books to operate, which also doesn't really meaningfully change all these harmful capitalist structures they see are so dangerous. Two, limiting your social spaces does not mean you have better interactions as what we explain. In fact, what it means is that your exposure is largely limited to the places where people are the most famous, most likely to get externally validated. Instead, the only ones you're going to be seeing on your timeline. And you're also going to get more and more shallow interactions with other people. And so far as you're not trying to externally validate yourself to an increasing amount. What we explained is not only do you get to interact with more everyday people, but also that the quality of that interaction makes you lower your own expectations about yourself. Since you get to know more about their personal and background stories, since people become more open about it. And I wanna make clear here is that we don't just say everyone is going to make large societal impacts, but that if everyone tries to find communities of their own, everyone tries to make more friends and reach out to more people, that's what leads to these kind of micro, macro impacts that we make clear. But third is accountability, i.e. healing is a process that requires a lot of difficult actions that you might personally want to do, but are very difficult to hold yourself accountable for. So knowing and wanting to go to a therapist that a friend had recommended you, wanting to start to exercise but need a gym buddy to be able to do so, I would note are very difficult things to do on your own, but in so far as some degree of external validation because you can gain friends, they tell you you're doing a good job still, make these difficult steps more and more easy. Two more things to note, however, about the difficulty of internal validation. The first thing I want to note is that they say you know yourself, but they don't explain the quality by which that occurs. We'd like to note that 
a lot of the time, you knowing about yourself without the ability to curate your own identity to other people that they drop after second neg is incredibly damaging because sometimes that kind of fresh start without you who knows all your insecurities, your failures, your traumas, et cetera, is an incredibly liberating experience when you can explore different forms of identity. But secondly, is it minorities who often, because of structures of power, when they are divided and unable to form these kinds of communities with one another, internalize a lot of these incredibly difficult behaviors. Secondly, on groups. The first thing I want to note is that a lot of their arguments come from a lack of groups, i.e. when you are so dependent and one breaks away, when you're so dependent and some might be busy, it was only amplify in so far as it is not the norm and you're not able to branch out and reach out to certain groups. But moreover, I think the self-help books, again, as we clarified from first, don't just tell you, accept any kind of validation from anyone. It is the ability to make good decisions, to choose healthier support groups that I think they never fairly respond to, only choosing to respond to the first. Lastly, they never have a good response to morality by only saying that either Buddhism already does this or this is not a meaningful amount of people when David already explains why it's a meaningful amount of people. And throughout the bench, we can like, name a lot of specific nuances that you can't do this yourself with because sometimes you don't know that you've hurt other people. Sometimes you don't know how to reparate it or the extent of the damage that you've done. A lot of the times, the degree of external validation is the pathway to forgiveness, is the pathway to knowing how to become a better friend, better family member, better spouse to another person. And there Therefore, these are things that only occur on our side of the house. You don't harm as many people as you once did. I'm very proud to propose. All right. Thank you for that um, speech and thank you for that excellent debate. Um, now, if we could have a breakout room for the judges, uh, we will attempt to wrap this up within the 15 minute time limit. Yeah, the uh, just give me a minute. I'm, I'm creating um, the breakout room. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Also, I think the recording is still in progress.